Welcome to the final edition this academic year of Inside EKU Sports. And our guest is Vice President and Director of Athletics, Matt Rohn, to begin. Matt, you take the job back at EKU where you spent four years, and then things have gone kind of haywire because of this COVID-19 pandemic. It's been an interesting time, hasn't it? It certainly has. Uh, to say that it's unique and to say that it's unprecedented is probably the understatement of a lifetime. Uh, but yeah, you're right, Greg, to have the opportunity to come back to EKU. Uh, started on February the 10th, I believe. Uh, so we're looking at three months, but it's been unlike any three months that I've ever had as an AD anywhere, uh, any in my professional career anywhere. And I think all of us can say the same thing, but it's a pleasure to be back uh, and a great to have the chance to work with yourself and so many great other people at EKU. So t- take us through the process of shutting down spring sports, students along with uh, student athletes, along with students across the campus going to online learning. What have been the key components that you've wanted to deal with and make sure you got right? Well, I think to answer your first question uh, or to answer your question first and then really kind of go back to the process, uh, I think communication has been the key all, all along. Um, and we're, we're really, you know, right-sized in terms of our department and the fact that we're able to communicate well. Uh, sport administrators are able to communicate with the coaches, and then that filters down to our student-athletes uh, very well. Uh, but really, to go back, we were very fortunate in the fact that our OVC tournament, as you know, was played the week before really everything shut down. Um, you would know that, you know, people were pulled off the floor at halftime of, uh, I believe, the ACC and the Atlantic 10. And you know, luckily, our winter sports have were able to be completed the weekend before. Uh, and so really, we were in the middle of spring break when all of this started happening. And then the decision was made by the institution to extend spring break for another week. And then that's really when the NCAA started communicating of what the forecast was going to be moving forward. Obviously, the financial implications that were going to come that was handed down on March the 27th. And so little bit by little bit, I think we've just reacted to the news as it has come. Um, obviously, we're doing our very best to, to forecast and project you know, scenarios ahead. Um, But you don't really want to spend a ton of time doing that just because you might be wasting a lot of time. Um, So we've done the best that we can with the resources that we have. Uh, But going back again, I think communication has been key. Um, We've met regularly as a staff. I know that programs have met regularly with their student athletes. Uh, All of our student athlete, athlete welfare areas, you know, strength and conditioning, sports medicine, Nebraska Student Athlete Academic Success Center. We have communicated often. with our student athletes to make sure that they understand that academic success is first and foremost, especially in an unprecedented time when we are online uh, and making sure that we're eliminating the hurdles to their success there. Uh, but really just the, the, the mental aspect, the welfare, how are they doing? How are they holding up? Um, you know, are they safe? Are they healthy? All those sorts of things. Uh, communication has been key in all that process. You played football in Southern Utah and then uh, before that at Virginia Tech. Can you imagine what some of these athletes have gone through? No, it's, um, you know, it's, I think they get a bad rap every once in a while. Um, but you can certainly say that, you know, right now experiencing what they're experiencing, they're a resilient bunch. Uh, you know, my heart breaks for those uh, prospective student athletes, those high, those high school seniors that are having their prom, their uh, spring sports seasons, their commencement, their graduation, their beach trips, you know, all of that stuff taken away from them. And then our, in the case of our student athletes, um, you know, yes, they are having the opportunity to return and to come back next year to repeat what would have been that senior year. But, but there's no replacing the start um, that softball was off to and what a special year that could have become. Hopefully we're able to replicate that in 21 and baseball and so many other sports were just off to unbelievable starts and to have that taken away and I mean, you know, Greg, I mean, some of our student athletes have been playing the games that they love since they were, you know, eight, seven, six, maybe even younger than that, Um, you know, a bat and and ball in their hands or uh, whatever it may be, um, really for their entire lives. And to have that taken away, it's been important for us that they understand that the resources that the, 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 the people that they, you know, know and trust and care about here on campus are still here for them. Most of the buzz has been around the start of football because, uh, especially the Power Five, it's the revenue driver. But do you have any sense of when will we kick off the football? When will they be able to spike the volleyball? When, you know, when will soccer hit the pitch again? And you can't just say, okay, the season starts. I mean, student athletes have to come back on campus, get in school if they're not already doing online work in the summer, and they have to train. I mean, you can't just start the season without any training. So, 
is this just a guesstimate? What do you think and how do you handle it at DKU? You know, there are certainly several layers. Um, obviously, you know, it's a state by state basis, how quickly states open up or how long they choose to, to phase in the process of reopening. Um, you know, the NCAA has, has dictated to us at this point in time that there are no on-campus activities um, through at least the end of May. Um, my best guess at this point in time will be that June will see a return to those on-campus activities. I'm hoping by July uh, that we'll see, uh, you know, your traditional summer workouts or summer school, you know, where student athletes are here and they're working out and they're preparing for those fall sports seasons. I'm hoping that that occurs. Um, and then, you know, again, it's a guess, uh, you know, to my point, just a few moments ago, uh, everything that you do, there's always that caveat of this may not occur. Um, but I think our hope at this point in time is, you know, come August, uh, cross country, volleyball, soccer, football, they'll be in training camp, uh, preparing for that fall sports season. Now, does it start exactly on time? Um, I'm not sure. Um, you know, there, could there be a, a one or two week you know, delay uh, in the start of those seasons? Uh, it's certainly very possible. You know, as you and I have talked uh, outside of this, you know, there's always the possibility that the fall brings, you know, some stop and start as well. And so that gets back to my point about just what, what we're doing. We're trying to forecast on what's a full season look like, what's a partial season look like, whether that's non-conference or conference, and then really what's no season at all. Uh, that's the nuclear option. That's one that none of us want to experience, uh, but it's certainly something that we have to be prepared for. But, you know, my best guess is that um, – just like our student athletes, you know, we're a, a nation built on resilient people. Um, and I think that we're going to see uh, fall sports and some sort of normalcy return um, this fall. And then you have to deal with the budget impact of all this as well. Inside, I know, already lean athletics program. We do. And, you know, you go back again to those um, those hypotheticals and, and those forecasts. And, you know, for us, uh, I think not surprisingly, um, you know, the best situation for us would be that it would start on time. Um, and again, that can swing a few weeks, you know, here and there. But, you know, for us to be able to play our guarantee games, uh, for us to be able to get those those non-conference games in matched with our conference season, um, that's something that's very important for us financially. Um, you know, if we did not have the chance to play the non-conference and, and just played the conference, that would probably, uh, to be very honest with you, be the most unfortunate situation financially uh, because you still have the expense without the revenue that would offset that. Um, and, but then the, you know, the middle ground financially, which would be the worst case for us all in terms of morale and spirit and, you know, all of that sort of thing would be that fall sports would not occur. And so again, we're, we're highly motivated and, and very optimistic um, that the fall will see a return to normal. All right, stick with us. I want to talk about your vision for EKU athletics. We'll get off the COVID-19 pandemic train and, talk about other things when we come back with Matt Rohn here on Inside EKU Sports. In real life, heroes don't wear capes. They wear masks, helmets, and badges. They teach, protect, and heal no matter what. And when unprecedented challenges turn our world upside down, EKU Colonels are there. Thank you for your service. We are more than just athletes. We inspire scholars. We inspire leaders. We inspire champions. We inspire family. This is the Ohio Valley Conference. Continuing our conversation with Vice President and Director of Athletics, Matt Rohn. Matt was Deputy AD at EKU for a couple of years, part of his four years at Eastern, before going to Nichols for three years as Athletics Director. Matt, glad to have you back. What did you learn at Nichols in your first athletic director job? Oh, man, I, I learned so much. Um, you know, I, I certainly learned that, that Eastern is a special place. Um, you know, the thing about Nichols is um, we have great people, um, people that want to help. Uh, so we have great people inside the department, great people outside of the department. But you certainly had some inherent challenges. Uh, you know, we were trying to operate, by the time that I left, uh, 17 programs. 
uh, with under a $10 million budget. Uh, and the travel in our league was no different than any OVC. I and mean, we were stretched from Thibodeau, uh, Louisiana, up to Conway, Arkansas, all the way west to, to Abilene, Texas. Uh, and so there were certainly some challenge there, challenges there. Um, but I think what, you know, what I learned uh, the most, Greg, I think, lot relying on, on that thought was uh, that you win with culture and that you win with people. Um, and that's what I kept saying all along, you know, that we weren't going to outspend people, uh, but we were going to have to make sure that when we hired coaches, we hired the right ones. When we retained them, we retained the right ones. When we hired staff and brought them on, we brought the right ones into the building. Um, and every single thing that we did, uh, it was to assist coaches, support student athletes. And, and that's the reason that we were able to have the success that we had there in three and a half years with several conference championships, both individual and team. Uh, we raised a lot of money for facility improvements and things of that nature. I think we got our brand out there. And when people recognized that Nichols brand, it became much more of a positive one. Uh, we really just aligned ourselves with the institution uh, as best that we could as well. We wanted to be a point of pride on campus before we were a point of pride. Uh, throughout that region. And so, you know, when I had the opportunity um, really over Christmas and New Year's when, when this opportunity started to, you know, really become apparent uh, and, and we went through the process, um, you know, I just thought about the, the fan base that, that's associated with EKU, uh, the tradition, the history, uh, the people that get excited about the Colonels, uh, the great coaches that I knew I was inheriting. Um, obviously, Coach Wells was, was a few weeks before my hire, uh, but having the experience to work with him back in 2015, um, I was excited about that. And then knowing that, you know, the institution uh, it wants to be successful. It wants athletics to, again, be that point of pride for it uh, and to assist with alumni engagement and, and uh, student recruitment and retention. Um, I just knew that this place could be a special one. Fun fact, also, you had a connection with A.W. Hamilton way back when we were both younger at Hardgrave Military Academy. Yeah, we uh, much younger, I guess. It's hard to believe that time goes by so quickly. But from, from August 2008 through May of 2009, uh, we sat probably uh, no, no more than 10 or 15 feet away from one another. He was an assistant basketball coach with Kevin Keats uh, at Hargrave, and I was an assistant football coach uh, with Robert Prunty. And obviously, Coach Keats is at NC State, and, and Coach Prunty is now the head football coach at Hampton, and AW and I find ourselves at EKU. So there were a lot of uh, really good, really fun people uh, in those rooms back then. The tradition of EKU football is storied, but uh, the Colonels haven't won a playoff game in a while. So what's your vision for football? What do you want to see happen to, to re-energize? Not that it's way down, but it needs a little bit of a boost. What do, what do you see there? And then after you answer that, just your vision for EKU athletics in general. Matt. Well, I will say, you know, Walt is, Walt is the subject matter expert. Uh, he understands what recruitment should look like, what football operations should look, should look like. Uh, and again, I think my job is, is to be in the background. And when he says, hey, this is what I need or this is what I want, it's to do what we can um, from a process and from a resource standpoint, a tool standpoint, uh, to, give him his, to give him what it is uh, that he thinks will allow him to be successful. I, I think we're this close. Um, again, I had a front row seat the last three years. Um, you know, where we made the playoffs uh, in 16, 17, or sorry, yes, 17, 18, and 19, sorry, at Nichols. And uh, each one of those years, we were able to host a game. And uh, years two and three, we were able to actually win and advance, uh, where we lost uh, to Eastern Washington in a close game and then uh, had the chance to take on a little team known as North Dakota State this past year uh, up in Fargo. And so, you know, I know the recipe for what it takes to be successful, and that's something that I want to bring here. And Walt and I have had several conversations about that, and I think together uh, we can get across that hump. But, you know, it, it's, it starts with putting a, a great staff together, um, and it starts at the top with him. And, and I think Walt, nobody loves Eastern more, and I think he surrounded him, see, himself with really good recruiters uh, and really good teachers who will teach the game and who will develop the young men that we bring into the program into good players and the good people. Um, you know, it, it, it always, uh, you talk about staff, but when you talk about people, you can't not talk about players. Um, players always make coaches look good. And so that recruiting piece, I think, is a critical element of what we do. And then, you know, just realizing how we operate. You know, where do we want to spend our resources? Um, you know, we have to improve our facilities, and that's something that's on me. Um, continue to improve our facilities. I know the east side was done, and, and we were excited to get that going when I left here in 2016. But you know, how do we fix the Begley building side? You know, how do we continue to improve the Mobley building? You know, make it 
we're, you know, we're the leader and not just the OVC, but regionally amongst our peers. Um, and, and, you know, and I think larger scale, um, when you talk about what it is that I want to accomplish and what is my vision for EKU athletics, it's, it's the same thing. Um, it's, it's letting our coaches dictate um, how they get there, but understanding that we do want to be competitively successful. Um, we want to be academically excellent. And we want our student athletes to give back to their communities and learn the leadership traits here uh, that they'll go and then take back to the places that they call home in the future. Um, I know that we can be successful in all three of those things. Um, I know that it's going to take a team effort at the same time. Um, you know, we have the support of our administration on campus. Um, we have our support from our board of regents. Um, but it's going to take every student, every faculty member, every staff member, uh, everybody in Richmond, Madison County, Eastern Kentucky, and beyond uh, to get it back where we want that to be. And that's folks buying tickets. That's working with Sean Hamilton to buy partnerships and sponsorships. Um, that's folks, you know, contributing to the Colonel Club. And we're wanting to rework some of those types of things to, to create excitement, really, you know, build that trust and that confidence. And you know, what I, what I hope for is a renaissance. Uh, you've been here and, and you've seen it at its, at its highs. Um, and I think that you would agree that we're that close to, to being there again. Uh, but when we do have that success on the floor, I want the seats to be full uh, because I do believe in this place. I believe in its people and, and I know that it can be successful. Great answer. You're on a milestone edition of Inside EKU Sports. It's the 100th and you are a founding father of this. Uh, Glad we have this show. I think it, it means a lot because it highlights a lot of things, the academic success of athletes and just how important they are both on the court or the field and in the classroom. And, uh, you know, tell me what, what you think it means to have this show because I, I started doing the Roy Kidd show on commercial television in the mid eighties. That was kind of the first coaches show. We've come a long way since then. No, I think it's great. Uh, and to, yeah, to be celebrating number 100, uh, I knew that we would get here. I, I think I didn't realize we would get here so quickly. Um, you know, it seems like just like that, we were uh, doing show number one. But it was really a collaboration between myself, Kevin Britton, uh, Sean Hamilton, because Sean worked so closely with us on the show uh, when it was a commercial television show, and then David Miller, uh, who does a phenomenal job. And Kevin and David, you know, really are probably the two that ran with it, with yourself, Greg, and you know, working with Leonard and so many great people in uh, university communications and, and uh, branding there. Um, you know, for us, it was all about being able to do exactly what you said, highlight the on the, the in competition and the out of competition success stories uh, of our student athletes, our coaches. Um, certainly, we wanted to have the opportunity to give 10 head coaches a spotlight, a platform uh, to be able to leverage those in season sports with those other opportunities, you know, to bring other things in and, and to, to share those stories. But uh, I think the show means a great deal. Uh, it shows, again, that we can do high-quality stuff on our campus. That is, that is a special place uh, with incredibly talented people. And uh, I think 200 will probably be better than 100, and we'll get there sooner than we know it. Sounds good. Well, as you know, it takes a team. And let's bring the team up and say thanks to everybody as we do our go-out with, with you, Matt. Uh, I hope to see you in person. Last time I saw you in person was at the OVC tournament. And uh, thanks for your leadership, and let's hope we're uh, – playing sports here in the fall. I look forward to it, Greg, and I appreciate everything that you do. There's there's nobody more synonymous with EKU and the Colonels than, than Greg Stottlemyre, and I appreciate everything you do for us. That's Matt Rohn, Athletics Director at EKU. Here's our staff. Thanks to everybody who's been involved in 100 shows of Inside EKU Sports, and hopefully this fall we'll go to show number 101. And when we come back here on Inside EKU Sports – We'll talk about strength and conditioning. What can you do to help athletes when nobody's on campus? That's next on Inside EKU Sports. EKU has been offering opportunity for more than 100 years. And it is still the campus beautiful, just as we remember it. All our favorite places to gather, study, relax, and meet will be here waiting for you. And we will be back here to soar to new heights, to teach the next generation, to discover, to heal, to protect, to communicate, 
to create. And with a little luck from an old friend, you'll be here soon to see familiar faces and learn something new. The only thing missing right now is you. We can't wait to celebrate our EKU customs. There are still many games and victories ahead. Bands will play, traditions will continue, and we will cheer Go Big E! Until we see you again, keep that EKU feeling in your heart, stay strong, and know that we can't wait to welcome you home because you are always an EKU Colonel everywhere you are. John Michael Davis, the Assistant Athletics Director for Sports Performance, joins us now on Inside EKU Sports. John Mike, uh, with everything shut down, how do you stay in touch with the student athlete, try to help them make sure they're still eating right and trying to stay in shape the best they can? You know, it's it's a multifaceted, you know, as far as getting communication. Uh, you know, one baseline that we send a lot of uh, programs and conditioning is email, you know, and send it to their email account. Then also good old technology, you know, that cell phone, that's get on, that's send them a text. That's how these kids communicate. They brought me back a generation. I'm a texter now. Uh, so we'll text our student athletes as well as, you know, sometimes we'll have meetings, um, you know, maybe they're brought into, you know, with, Hey, look, they're getting together here. Hey, how are y'all doing? FaceTime. Just any kind of means we can reach out uh, to our student athletes. One, to ensure that they're okay. Number one, you know, the weight room is going to be here. It's, you know, it's going to be here. It's not going anywhere. But how are these student athletes doing at home or wherever their current living situation is? That's priority one, checking on them. Um, and then it's also good for us, you know, because I miss the Dickens out of them. You know, I miss the interaction with them. So it's good for us and uh, the staff that I work with as well to see our student athletes. You, Everything you do as far as a, a workout has to be voluntary. You can't organize mandatory workouts. So Correct. it's on them or right. It's yes. on them to, to follow through. You know, and, you know, weeks ago, months ago, when this whole thing started, you know, I was reaching across the country. Hey. What are you doing at this university? Well, I'm going to step Zoom meetings and we're going to have Zoom workouts. Well, that lasted for about a day. Then the NCAA was like, no, no, not doing that. And so it is. It is completely voluntary. And, you know, we'll send guidelines. And this stuff, you know, because we've got athletes in all different states, different towns with different, you know, like Georgia, South Carolina, there. Regulations are a little bit different right now than ours here in Kentucky or what it looks like in California. So what we did, we sent some body weight moves that they could do. We sent some stuff that they could do with the broomstick. But more importantly, uh, what we're going to be sending out is, you know, soup can girls and Tide detergent rows can only do so much. But sprinting has the biggest carryover. Can you get out and sprint? Do you have an area? Or is it just simple, you need to walk up and down steps, you know, and mobility. You know, a lot of our athletes, that's, that's a couple of things we can really grasp and spend time on now is our mobility, flexibility, and our conditioning levels. And also uh, the positive mind frame. You know, I think most people in college athletics, we, you know, you commit so much time and effort to your sport and to your studies. And now they're still doing the studies, but their sport is way by the wayside right now. Well, now you get to have conversations with people you wish you could have a conversation with. You know, like I've had a chance to FaceTime my mom every day. You know, a lot of times I haven't done that. And I hope these athletes are taking advantage. And I think most of them are, you know, spending time with their siblings, mom and dad or family and friends. You know, that a lot of times they wouldn't have access to on a daily basis. We had Matt Roan on earlier in the show, the athletics director, and there's hope, and nobody knows, but June, July, students can get back on campus and you can get back in the weight room, fingers crossed. How sure. long is it going to take? To, uh, they're always training. So is there going to be a, a curve here to, to get back in so-called near playing shape? Oh, you know, absolutely. You know, this is uncharted waters. You know, for us, you know, unless you look back to the World War or the Spanish flu back in 1918 and uh, 
last time I checked, there weren't any strength coaches in the collegiate or professional settings during that time. So we don't really have mentors we can rely on. Like, how do you do this? You know, the closest thing we have is the NFL uh, lockout or holdout years ago. And what we learned was the rate of injuries were through the roof. So what we need to understand as a profession is, look, let's look at these student athletes. Let's meet them where they are. Not where they should be, but actually where they are. You know, that's say, you know, and you hear all these different theories and all these different models like, hey, we're going to come back July 1. The football season is starting here. Or volleyball, you know, whatever season is starting. What we need to look at is, okay, that's where they are. And I've kind of been doing some trial runs with myself and some friends. And so, you know, we work on percentages based off of one rep max or some kind of testing protocol, you know, to gauge our progression through our training model. Well, what we may say is 75%, actually maybe 45%. Because, yes, you, you want to get faster. You want to get stronger. And you want them the kids to look good and feel good. But at what cost? You know, I'm not willing to risk and rush a student athlete's success. So I want to get them here. Let's see how well they're moving. It's going to be a lot of reteaching. You know, a lot of these kids don't have access to what we're blessed with here. And so that's reteach. Instead of maybe doing a clean or a snatch, let's jump again. How are my kids landing? Are their knees rolling in? How do their ankles look? And it's going to be a constant building process. And, you know, with – you know, I'm just speaking for myself and our staff, and, you know, we've had conversations with coaches, but honestly, we want to be ahead of everybody else, you know? Everybody wants to be, well, you know, maybe we can do this, maybe we can do this, and the biggest thing is the kids need to be healthy, to be on the field, the court, you know, and the guidelines that we're going to use is we're going to do reduced time under tension, which means maybe less reps. You know, we're not going to go into certain phases. What I'm going to use is day one, you know, after we get all the screening and we get all the health and we kind of see where our student athletes are mentally first, you know, how they're feeling. Then we can start moving into it. Like I'll move into what I call a dynamic day. And there's barely any weight on the student athlete. It's going to be a lot of body weight movement, seeing what they're giving us see how our jumping and our running look at a reduced effort. Then the second day, we're going to increase a little bit of volume. After we increase that volume, you know, we're going to see how what their heart rate looks like. We're going to look at to see how, what their body's telling us, what they're telling us. And then we'll move into more of a little bit of heavier day. Where our heavier days, you know, it could have been 10 set of two. Well, now it may be three set of one. Just a little bit easier moving into it and just making sure that we're staying healthy and we're putting these kids in a situation to be successful. John, Mike, thanks for all the updates. Hope, hope you get back and it gets active over in the Marvinley building again. Thank you, sir. All right, John Michael Davis, he is the assistant AD for sports performance. And that does it for another edition of Inside EKU Sports. We hope to see you beginning on season five in the fall sometime in August. And as always, go Big E.